guys, I'm here at Nobby 24, the North American Honey Bee Expo in Louisville, Kentucky. I've got Troy Hall of it's Hall Apiaries, right? Yep. That's your business name? Correct. And where are you out of? We're located in Plainfield, New Hampshire. Okay. Now, you're not too far from Michael Palmer and some of those guys, right? You're, nope. Like, yeah. You've got a real winter. We oh. normally will get snow in... It starts in November around Thanksgiving, and typically that snow, if we have a, a normal winter, will be the same snow that melts off in April. Yeah. It'll be like that last base of snow wow. that's... But that's not the case this year. We don't even have any snow when we left, you know, just the other day. So. Yeah. So how many colonies are you running now? I manage... Um, all together, there's around, I think we had, we put to bed 710 colonies okay. this, this winter. And they're doing, we, do, we manage different types of, uh, of endeavors with the bees. We have our 300 colonies that I used to produce honey with. And then we breed queen bees. So we have a population of colonies. I don't really count that into the numbers. But we, they're, they're, they're mini mating nucleus colonies that I overwinter. Yeah. So they're kind of these, these intact populations of bees that are on mini combs. Um, just specifically for breeding queens. And we raise around 300, 350 uh, nucleus colonies every year to for a place winter loss and also for a sale. Okay. And all those are yours. How many, do you have employees, part-time help or anything yep. to help I, you manage those in the season? We, I have one, one full-time helper okay. who is available in the summer months. So 350 nukes, how many of those are you selling a year? It depends. If we have a good, if we have a good winter survival, I, my objective is I could easily sell all of them if I wanted to. Yeah. So if I have a high mortality rate in the honey production portion of my apiary, You're I have I covering use, your losses you got first. It. Yep. So everything kind of above my needs is sold off. So, but, so you're selling overwintered nukes in the spring. Then do you sell same year nukes? No. Yeah. Everything I sell is an overwintered okay. nucleus colony. So that's a higher. Well, that's a should be a higher price because yep. you can sell them earlier in the year. Especially where you're at, that makes a difference. Yes. Yeah. Yep. Um, now, are you running a treatment-free apiary or treatment minimal? I know you're focusing yep. on. Uh, that sort of queen breeding in yep. your program. It has, has traditionally, from the beginning, when I built the apiary up, mm -hmm. I withheld all treatments. Okay. And, and then in 2021, I lost 90% of the apiary. Yikes. And I had to completely kind of step back and reevaluate what I need to do to not repeat that again. Yeah. And so since then, I've, I've, I'm. It's kind of a minimal treatment, and I'm not trying to be, you know, stick to a, a paradigm of treatment free. So like religiously, in a sense, but I'm trying yeah. to. Look at like what's realistic, what's sensible, what's exactly. We so you, go you're using selection. carboassays mostly. Have yeah, you, have to you determine used, BSH. Have you done UBO yet? UBO? No, I have not. Uh, this this year, I, I I'm on the list for getting the. Yeah, uh, I am too. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. So that's exciting though, just to be able to have this. Yeah, I, I think it'll be a good a good way. So how many years have you been in this? I've been commercial. I've been managing or having my theory sustain my. Uh, as a vocation since 2010. Okay. And I started so keeping... So this is your 14th year, going into your 14th I, it's year. Cr I keep thinking about that. It's, amazing. <laughs> it's like a, it's time flies. But um, and I started keeping bees in 2005. I was out okay. of high school. So, And uh, we talked about nukes. You're doing 350 nukes, and you cover your winter losses. How many would you say that you sell in, in an average in year? In an average year, I take orders for about 100 nukes. Okay. So if, if I... That's about an average. You know, if, I, if it was a good year and I can sell an extra 50, you know, or even another 75 on that. My, I'd like my next kind of, what I'm pushing towards, if I can kind of push it to like, if I can sell 200, that's always the next kind of do level. You, do you market mite resistance? Yes, since I can now, I before where I could actually look at BSH as something I could mm -hmm. quantify or measure, I'd always just tell people that they are, you know, I, it's, untreated. You tell, yeah, like what is resistant? To define that, right? Yeah, it's like these bees aren't going to go home, and you're not going to not you're not going to be able to get away from not treating them. You know, you need to be responsible and, yeah. and, and keep an eye out for mites, and deal with mites accordingly. But yeah, I tell them that they're they're I, actually I just tell them they're they're, they're BSH. You know, they have high BSH Bread from expression. BSH stock. Yeah. So are you charging a premium in your nukes because of that? Oh, yeah. All yeah. Right. So what, what are you selling nukes for in your area? Um, this spring, my if I have them to sell, they're 265 265 How many queens are you producing and selling? We, I'll, I'll, I'll raise around, we catch out of the mating nukes, they'll probably be around 
at the, at maybe 12 to 1500 queens. So you're selling mated queens? Yes. Okay. Well, with the help of friends, I yeah. learned that you know there's virgins are an option too. Yeah. But primarily, I the mated queen has been the uh, the one you know option available for people that wanted to buy yeah. queens. Yeah. Mated, mated. If you add mated to queens, <laughs> there is a um, infrastructure tail oh, that my goes gosh. with that. Yes. Uh, just uh, multiple levels. Uh, there's a lot that goes into it. So. You're doing 12, 1500 of those. Um, how many, what are you pricing those at since they are a VSH stuff? 45. 45 bucks. I'm always, okay. what's like, what's the, I always go shop, like, what's the, what is this worth to somebody? And I'm always trying to think reasonably, like, if I, if I was, you know, on a budget, what would this, yeah. what would I be willing to spend for a queen? But then I'll, I have all these people that are, you know, around me helping me or yeah. aware of the amount of sheer work and labor and time it takes. And I was like, you're always too cheap. I'm like, well, I don't know what's a fair price on a good queen nowadays. So, yeah. Um, how do you ship queens? Yep, I ship. Okay. We, yep. Local pickup on nukes, I'm guessing, and then you do ship queens. Yep, queens are shipped. Exactly. Local how, pickup. How, how do people get in contact with you? They can. I have a website. My website is uh, nhbeekeeper.com. Uh, you can find my contact information um, there at Holly. You know, nhbeekeeper.com. My bis the apiary of the farm name or the name in my apiary is Holly Apiaries. So um, I I don't really promote very. I'm, I, it's like I find people just find me organically. I'm not out yeah. there to make a big thing. But I do have a face or a YouTube channel that I will put things that I feel are pertinent for people to know. So there's the YouTube channel, it's Holly Theories on YouTube. But um, anyways, yeah, and then my email is just troy at nhbkeeper.com. All right, honey, you got 300 production colonies on average. Now you're in New Hampshire, so you're not like me in Tennessee. We have a spring flow, <laughs> we have a dearth, and we have a very erratic <laughs> yeah. fall flow sometimes it, it's just pollen sometimes we'll get a little bit of nectar from it yeah so your flow comes in and pretty much doesn't stop until it stops yeah it's a pretty it's like that compacted yeah. northern kind of you know there's so a, when does your flow start is it in may or is it closer to june yeah it's it's may when we typically have apples in full bloom in by the 12th or 15th of may where i am okay so from there we have apples and then and that's dandelions and then the honeysuckle and then some of the other later summer like the black locust will flower and wow and, you're nearly a month behind me yeah yeah um, and i it, mean like a full four weeks that's <laughs> yeah. that's crazy yeah, yeah. I, I love watching well you watch youtube videos of you know folks getting their opening yeah. their bees what it would be probably in april maybe late march or mid-march See, the northern beekeepers like watching the southern yes. beekeepers it gets in, us all excited in march and april because you've got <laughs> snow on the ground yeah <laughs> and i'm out working bees in like short sleeves yep <laughs> yep so, after dandelion, uh, what what does it move to in June and July? What does your flow move to? Clover is a pretty big one. Different is that types. Dutch, Dutch white or sweet clover? Yep, the Dutch usually Dutch all psych. Uh, so the white sweet clover is to like late mid to late June. That'll that'll start popping up. We don't get a lot of yellow sweet clover unless it's planted in a cover crop. But uh, mm -hmm. our, yes. our big flow that makes up a good crop, a good percentage of my honey crop would be linden or basswood. Yeah, that's, basswood. That's, yeah. that's usually around the 4th of July week for us is when that's in full You, you know, it's strange. There's a few different, um, I don't know if you'd call them cultivars or species or what, oh. subspecies yep. of basswood. Yep. I've got a, a southern species where the, um, the underside of the leaf is silvery looking and it's got hairs on it. Yep. And it is an incredibly erratic producer it's either good or not it's either flowering or yeah, not. yeah yeah la la this past year they actually bloomed uh first year in three years that they bloomed but they produced nothing yep um and up where you're at they can still be pretty erratic but it's a whole lot more reliable than yep. i think you've got a different subspecies we have i don't know the latin but it's pretty much it would be no, it's if you looked up you know in an Audubon book or a, yeah. be just American basswood you know the, 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 the American basswood we we have uh, some ornamental or European varieties that are in like parks and they have that okay. typical canopy that's like a nice kind of kind of a heart shaped yeah. kind of canopy um, but the American basswoods grow taller kind yeah. of more of a you know they're if you looked at them without foliage they have more of a kind of a the distinct look about them, you know, when without the leaves on the trees. And the, usually, along any river, well-drained soil, sandy yeah. loam, you'll, you'll have basswood, and that's that's a huge percentage of our honey crop. 
and that's a sort of a light color oh. minty yep the minty honey. honey yes yeah yeah it's good stuff oh it makes a phenomenal comb honey and li- you know liquid honey i i being that it's what we produce and what we're familiar yeah. with i i my palate is just adjusted to it where it's like i just feel like that's home for me yeah with honey but for you it might be sour wood or maybe i don't know just uh, sumac thinking, sumac I, yes. I really like sumac honey yep. the tanginess yep and, um, i really like that um so do you go after varietals or do you just do a wildflower um as my apiary has grown um and i'm more in where i started to push a population of bees more for production of honey um i i don't have the luxury like i used to with varietals um i do have like an ability to kind of extract yard to yard because each yard will produce yeah. you know a truck. So, basswood being such a major crop do you try to keep it pretty pure or do you let it mix? i try yeah i can't yeah in a year where i can see it's going to be a big contri- a big contributing nectar source to the honey i'll it's if i if we start to get into some yards where it's a lot of basswood we'll just try to segregate keep, the keep supers. That separate yeah yeah otherwise it gets that's that's one thing that's difficult to do you know if you've got a big crop of honey and you're on a you know you're you're kind of limited in in, in your manpower uh, manpower you got to get the get it get it through and you got a bunch of other stuff you got to do with your bees at the same time being able to have that luxury of segregating out the yeah. varietal honeys and a small commercial apiary can be intense sometimes to make those just you know how to how to logistically and feasibly with time to do that yeah and when you're in a heavy flow you need to get the supers extracted and then get them back on and yeah it, if you don't have a lot of manpower it's hard no. to do that now you actually I, I usually just let the we just let this i just keep piling them on until this flows yeah our flow is done usually by the middle of july we've got an idea what the summer crop looks like okay so that we the, can this is an interesting question yes um how many supers do you, do you run yeah. medium supers yes mediums how yeah. many mediums do you allocate per production column on paper <laughs> yes <laughs> and then and then the real answer yes uh, on paper it was it's always i don't know why i figured three and a half because there's no such thing as a half a super but um I, on paper it was I, I always kind of figured this this here's the population of bees here's the number of supers i need on in store to, to produce the crop yeah so three and a half but realistically to be safe probably four see that's interesting because uh bob benny allocates about two and a half but he's got a big crew yep and he's got a cow in 60 and you, you know forklifts and all that stuff so they can churn through whereas me i'm it yep the truck and, driver yeah and i've got kids <laughs> so i'm allocating like three and a half four yep so if they get into a good flow i don't lose it yep. because i can't churn through my supers and get wet supers back out yeah quick enough so that's the same um, story um yeah, yeah yeah when you when you're short on manpower you just have to stack them higher and Yep. <laughs> deal with it when you can and break your back getting them down getting yeah that's all you, well i'm six three <laughs> so that's not as much of a challenge um yeah i i can i can reach them but i tell you my back doesn't <laughs> like it sometimes no all right so how many how many pounds of honey do you typically get per colony in a year the average like my as brother adams would say like you know what's the five-year running average yeah um at least like guys like michael palmer kirk webster that like kind of like set this foundation for me in your that, area in yeah. my area that, that, that like watching these gentlemen work their you know establish their apiaries and how they do things and that was the same thing like you talk with them and it's always like well here's your average you know your average over the span of time for me and it's about 85 pounds okay colony. okay so it's it's not the it's funny right you some guys are you know you're talking hundreds of pounds yeah and i think uh where we are where it's it's really heavily forested we don't have a lot we have agriculture and it's i mean if you envision kind of where i'm at in new england it's very you know not like mountainous but it's hilly mountainous uh valleys with river you know river valley so any anything along a river valley or you know kind of in between the the hills or the the mountains is where you're going to find some meadow or open bee pasture if it's not forested so yeah. it's um, yeah, it's a pretty it's a pretty wild type environment when it comes to the diversity of you know nectar available. Yeah, I'm very similar. Uh, Nash the Nashville Basin is more of an agricultural area, and they've got a different subspecies of plant life than where I'm at. I'm in the western the base of the Western Highland Rim, so yeah. I get a little mix of both. We're very diverse, 
and uh, it's a lot more hardwood tree species, shrubs, bushes, wild, you know, wild plants, things like that. And my average would be about the same, you yep. know, about 80 to 100 pounds. Last, uh, last year was about 80. It was not a good year. Uh, the year before that was about 95, and it was an okay year. So, yep. You know, some somewhere in that in that average, I think, is probably where I would be as well. I think so, it's a good average. Yeah, it, it's it's economical. Yep. You know, if you can get that every year, you can make it work. Yep, you can make it work. Um, so your flow starts about May fifteenth. Your flow stops about the summer crop. We get two crops if in an average year. So the summer would, summer crop would subside and be over with by the middle of July, um, and then the fall crop. Uh, which is obviously for every most of you goldenrod and yeah. aster, and we get Japanese do, knotweed. Do you um, actually get goldenrod honey? Yes, we can. Okay, so yes. that butterscotch flavor yep. that crystallizes super Very fast, quickly. Yes, yeah. get it into the bottle or into something yeah, that we, you can. We never get pure <laughs> uh, pure goldenrod. I don't know if it's a soil type thing or if it's just all mixed with aster. But when we get fall honey, it, it tastes more like aster than it okay. does. And that Golden doesn't rod. crystallize quickly for you? It will, yeah. Okay. Yep. We usually don't get enough to extract, though. I, I mean, I, I typically don't put supers on okay. in the fall. So the bees usually put it in the brood nest for They you. do. Yep. And I'm, I'm generally feeding, you know, starting in August to get them heavy enough to yep. make it through winter, just to keep them stimulated and stuff. So you're pulling your fall crop... September? Yeah, we. that's... that's October? You, you, just caught, you just touched base on a really kind of difficult dynamic that I, I dance every yeah, year with. yeah pulling pulling the fall crop off and then getting them fed trying and heavy enough for winter you don't have a you don't have much of a timeline no there. yeah you have to I, actually what I end up doing the last several years is to decide a pop out of the honey producing yards that I have which which ones do I want to produce the little uh, fall crop I don't produce a uh, fall crop on all the bees that yeah. I, I kind of I want something that's close to home where I can quickly get it off get it extracted and get to feeding if it's needed so um, I'd say like half of my honey production colonies are producing a fall crop. Um, and yeah, so we, by, by in September is the month where you have to get the fall feed in if, it, if it's needed. Because we, the bees are clustered in, in a tight, you know, they're clustered. They're in not taking rate. syrup in October. By, yeah, by the, if you're, if we have a, a long run into a war with warm weather, by the second week in October, it's usually done and they're, they're not taking any more syrup. Yeah, well, that is tough. And you're balancing that. Uh, do you do you have good market demand for fall honey, or is it a yeah. lower quality, lower price no, product? No, the uh, the yeah the market up where I am, you know, obviously where I'm, I'm marketing direct to customers, you know, retail yeah. um, or even bulk directly to the you know whoever you know where it's going into meat or, or some other you know good that that's that where they're using honey as an ingredient, um, but. People are my at least my customers are, are sourcing, looking for me because I I, pro I provide honey that's raw and unfiltered. Where yeah, that, that's that's what they're looking for. If I if if I needed to push out into other markets, obviously I'd have to completely do you know I'd have to produce the honey or uh, I'd have to um, filter or maybe do something different. You know, be able to, to ship it into other wholesale markets that are that are meet meet the demand or the the expectations of other wholesale markets. But yeah, that's I'll, never been a problem. I almost think it's easier for me to put the bees to bed for winter than it is for you because you, you actually make a fall honey crop. You've got a market for it, and you want to extract that revenue. And then the fall honey is not as high a quality feed, winter Correct. feed. It's got a lot more solids in it, um, which can cause some issues. Mm -hmm. So you want to pull as much of that as you can, but you want the bees to be as heavy as they can be. <laughs> yeah. And you don't have much time to get feed into them if you need to get feed into them so i'll yeah. tell you it's a stressful time of year for you making all those decisions and just doing the best you can yeah no i i i think i always tell, like for me i always tell people you have to grow into that type of a, yeah for me to grow into the apiary like building it up because having the infrastructure to feed quickly and fish, yeah. you know without let with, 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 with are, are you feeding two to one yes yeah so that takes uh stronger pumps oh gosh uh, yeah. it takes Heat to get that stuff to mix. Are you are you feeding sucrose <laughs> syrup? Or are you yeah, doing sucrose? Um, okay. Yeah, we don't have any we, uh, high, our, high fructose corn syrup. Yeah, we don't have a way to get any sort of tanker, you know, kind of yeah. qualities. Just quantities dropped off, and it's like we, up our way. Our, anybody that's man, wintering bees up our way has to kind of fend for themselves with, with making their own sucrose syrup. Yeah. So a pump that will pump two to one. Yep. Is tough. Yes. It makes everything harder. Yep. Um, 
Yeah, that's <laughs> I, like like I said, my, getting my bees ready for winter is easier. Uh, in August, the light ones I start feeding them, and I can feed them one to one until yes, October. That's right. <laughs> and they're done. <laughs> and they're done. Yep. And that's all I got to do. I don't worry about the fall crop because most of the time it's just a pollen flow. And uh, you know, if I feed them one to one while they're getting that pollen flow, they'll build up mm -hmm. and be healthy and looking good going into winter and heavy. So yeah, there's some seasons that we get where the bees are everything was in the honey supers. Yeah, and we fail to get a fall flow. Ooh. So then there's this huge push to just feed, feed, feed. You know, yeah. when we're buying pallets and pallets and pallets of sugar. Where are you getting pallets of sugar from? I am always out looking. Where's the best? <laughs> where's the best bargain? Can I drive there? Do I want to drive there? Can I get you know four pallets on my truck? Or you know, I, I, the last few seasons I've been working with just food purveyor you know companies that can give me you know they'll drive a truck and drop off X number of pallets at a reasonable like price. restaurant supply stores yep. and stuff like that. Yep. Yeah. I gotta start. I gotta start checking into that. Yeah. It, it, anything just gotta hit the street. You know, hit the ground and sniff around for. You know, we're sugar's expensive. It's become right now. very it's expensive. Really expensive. It's over seventy cents a pound. Oh yeah, I think just our way for a pallet, we we're paying. I think we were delivered. You're paying a little bit, almost eighty cents a pound. Yeah. So it's become quite the. Uh, it's I, have, I haven't raised my honey price in two years. So. <laughs> uh, yeah, I may. I may have to take a look at that. What are you selling honey for a pound? Um, in the. In the bottle. Per pound, seven fifty. Seven fifty a pound. Yeah, like case lots to you know just kind of move. Uh, oh, is that wholesale? Wholesale. Wholesale. Yeah. Okay. What so, are you retailing for? Retail. I think uh, if someone stopped in and wanted to buy a jar, I think it's about twelve dollars right now. Okay. So, are you selling mostly wholesale? Yeah, most of it. I'd say eighty some odd percent is moved out in a wholesale. Is that through di distribution or individual stores? Yep, uh, distribution. We have a couple of distributors that we work with, or I work with, and then a lot of it within like a 30 mile radius. There's a lot of you know food co-ops and different grocers and retailers that we move it out to. And that's yeah. a whole, that's a whole other job. Oh yeah. Oh my gosh. I'm, I'm working through that now. Like I've got a bunch of stores that I wholesale to, and I'm delivering honey all the time. Yeah. And uh, it's an application process to get in with bigger chains. Yep. But when you go to the bigger chains, you can call up, you know, you use Freight Quote or somebody to yep. do a lesson load, and they'll come pick it up and drop it off at their distributor. And I'm not out delivering honey three days a week. Yep. So that's something I'm having to grow through, and uh, I'm going to have to put a lot more thought into that because bee season's almost here. I don't have time to deliver honey no. three days a week. Yeah, no, it's it's one of those aspects of my theory and my business, you know, just trying to logistically think of how do you keep some you know how do you do it all yeah and that that's actually been one of the fun things about managing my apiary and kind of doing it on the scale that i have been is that it, it is all on me or you yeah and how do you keep it fun and how do you at the same time you know be able how do you become more efficient with all those aspects i need a high school kid to deliver <laughs> honey for me is what i need <laughs> yes I'm, I'm pretty serious about that i understand <laughs> I would pay them well. <laughs> well, how many high school kids want a driver's license today? Well, at least up. I, I mean, there, there's a few. <laughs> there's a few. There's, there, there are kids that want to work and make money. So I just got to find um, one good one. One good one. That's all I need. Yep. One good one. Good. Yeah, I, I really it. appreciate you talking with me. You've got this neat operation that's sort of in the. Um, Kirk Webster, Michael Palmer, and sort of what I'm wanting to do. You know, have several hundred hives be stationary. Yep. Um, work work on mite resistance and selling. You know, and up market queen yep. genetics. Uh, make honey and wholesale and retail it. Don't sell it bulk. Yep. And have an operation that I can keep minimum amount of uh, labor and inputs into. Yep. Not get too big, but make a living and support my family. Yep. That's, you know, I think there's a sweet spot there that people can <laughs> can do. There sure is. You know, and um, it, it's an inspiration to see that you've been doing it for 
yeah. 14 years now. No, I, I, right, I, I like what you said. When I, I remember meeting guys like Michael Palmer, Kirk Webster, and actually, you know, working with them for a day or a couple, whatever, just being, you know, like you said, showing up, putting your hands on the thing, you know, working alongside them. And in my early 20s, I was just... I couldn't I I didn't graduate high school thinking that was even a, an option yeah you know and then I was just exposed to that reality of this is a this is a very reasonable way to do this and yeah. live a life and I remember at that point in my life I was like I'm, I'm gonna fail trying yeah and I just keep telling people I have I just I, I felt like sometimes I like in two, when I lost most of my bees like well that's that's a failure yeah but it's like you just <laughs> pick the horse and push it back up and get back on and keep riding it but the, the this idea or the the very real kind of reality of having this small small but I guess the idea of a of an apiary that's kind of built around a geographic footprint that's not it's it's station it's it's, yeah. it's non migratory and you're you're it's a peaceful way of life and it it's I don't know how to describe it. it's just different than I, I think it's a good a good quality of life yes you know, I've not found anything that's really bad about beekeeping. You're producing something that's good for people, it's good for the environment, good for the ecosystem. Um, you know, it, it's just, you're doing something that is good for me, mentally, spiritually, physically. Yes. Every day, I'm doing something that's good for me. Uh, there's just not a lot bad about it. No. Um, you know, even the things, you can argue that, yeah, they hurt, and sometimes the bees make me really mad. <laughs> really mad yeah but um, you know it, a bad day there is better than the desk job I, I used to have exactly one quick thing I was thinking about um, there's this book titled uh, the American letters from the from an American farmer uh -huh. I think the name of the author it was written in the mid 1700s like 1750 to 1780 so kind of right around the Revolutionary War but the author I think his name if I'm not misquoted is a Hector J Hector, Hector St. John he was a Frenchman and he, he kind of poetically and romantically talks about America at this point in time where you could come over and immigrate to this country, buy a piece of land, and work your butt off, clearing it, you know, getting it ready to, to, to grow crops on and to build a family, yeah. build, you know, put your home. My point is that our, our country in some way, when it comes to being this one-man show or the small entity, the family or, an into, or a, a couple or whatever, just this desire to kind of work, work with nature, or work with your hands, do something that's that's kind of permeates more than just this idea of making a lot of money, yeah. but satisfies all aspect of what it is to be kind of human, and then to, to have this kind of think something you can look back on over a few years or over a lifetime and say, wow, you know, this is something really cool, really special, and a I, life well spent. A life well spent, and uh, and a pe like you don't have to go around trying to sell something to somebody and. Try yeah. to make somebody see your point of view to, you know, to, for the sake of some sale or whatever. Yeah, sell, selling something to people that they really don't need. Yes. Yeah. So that, that, that this book, the, the book, the letters to an American farmer, really just kind of talks a lot about what you just mentioned, and I think it's really just thinking about it how um, that that way of living has kind of almost been forgotten by I think our culture. But yeah. I think in some ways in beekeeping lately, where you have someone like yourself or like myself where we're kind of you know at the point of our lives where we're the most productive we're looking at all the options and we're beekeeping or this type of way of agriculture is is appealing to us and i think that that's kind of cool how it's kind of come full circle and it's it's still an option and it's just as year it, it gives us all the benefits and rewards as it did just a couple hundred years ago yeah so that's one of the reasons I do this YouTube channel, and I'm doing, it's had to change because I've had so much workload increase in the beekeeping. I can't set the cameras up and, yeah. and all that. So I started doing just a vlog style with a cell phone, yeah. uh, building a bee business vlog. And uh, the main reason that I've kept that up is because I think someday there will be a young man or woman who doesn't want to go to college and finds this video series on YouTube and becomes a beekeeper and builds a career out of it yeah. because they see me do this. Yep. And they, you know, they avoid a lifetime of college debt and get it figured out. <laughs> and uh, so that, that's kind of why I do that. Yeah. No, I, I, I think people can do it. I, I really do. I think they can do it. The opportunity's there. You got to be smart. You got to make good decisions. Yep. And you got to work hard. Yep. But My dad would always there. say, "You just you got to be hungry enough." Yeah. <laughs> so. Yeah.
All right, Troy, I, I really do yeah, appreciate it. It's been great talking to you. You too.